So amen, church. It's good to see you this morning. Uh, you guys can take a seat. Happy Father's Day today. Uh, we're going to get into celebrating dads here in just a minute. But there's something that I want to talk about before we get into that. And, and this is something that we've had, you know, back in the back uh, for the last couple of weeks, for the last two weeks. And if you weren't here for any of that series, um, I would just really hope you go online, go to our YouTube page and watch those messages. Because I really unpack some stuff that God's put on my heart. Uh, he's put two words on my heart, one of them being discipleship. So I don't know how many people here have got your, your level one disciple, those people that you're messaging every week. That's right. I see two hands. So I'm glad that at least two of you have listened to the message. So that's great. Yeah. Um, but then the second part of that is vision. Where are we going? What is it that South Point is, is we're saying this is our direction. This is where we're headed. And part of that is growth. It's being a kingdom building church. It's going out into the community. And in order to do that, we've needed uh, some volunteers added to this team. Uh, I think we're ready to open a second service. Um, but we needed the volunteers. And guess what? We, we gave you guys an opportunity to sign up here uh, for these different areas. And let me show you over two weeks how many people have signed up? So we'll put these numbers on the screen for you here. Our welcome teams had five people, four in hosting, six in pastoral care, four in production, four in worship and band, six in stage design and props, and nine in family ministries. Yeah, I'm really excited about this family ministry number because our kids matter. They matter so, so, so much. So I have nine more people say, hey, I want to serve there. And then stage design and props, I, I think it's about time that on Sundays, you know, that we've got uh, something fun behind us here that goes with the sermon series that we're doing. And so to have six people say, hey, I want to be a part of that, uh, that's just really incredible. So the total number of new volunteers that we have up to date is we have 38 new volunteers in two weeks. <laughs> two, in two, two weeks, we've had 38 new volunteers. Now, one of the things I've been talking to you guys about and direction and, and vision is if your dreams are possible to you, then they're probably offensive to God. And uh, that we want to dream the dream that we don't know how it makes sense, that we can't make it make sense. So then we know that only God is able to make it make sense. So what I would like to see today is I would like to see uh, 12 more people sign up today. So that brings us to 50 new volunteers. So I would have thought, okay, 30, easy, 38, amazing, celebrate it, take it for what it is, walk off stage, be happy with it. But you know what? I feel like in my heart, let me just go for the number that I don't think could actually happen and say, okay, that's 50. So today I'd love to see at least 12 more people say, hey, I want to volunteer in one way or another here at the church. And th this is a saying here. This is um, something that my wife is terrified of because I say it all the time. If some is good, then more is better. And that can be used in a lot of different ways, a lot of good ways, and also in a lot of bad ways. If some ice cream is good, then more ice cream is better, right? Yeah, amen, amen. Doesn't work with drugs, okay? If some are good, more is not better. But in, with volunteers, it very much works. If some is good, more is better. Let's, let's get 12 more. And then we've got on July 2nd, uh, Linton and I, Pastor Linton, we're planning um, an orientation where we get all those new volunteers in, plus our existing volunteers. And we just get you guys in the same room together and we do some vision casting. We have fun. Uh, we break into groups. We get to know each other. This is where community comes together and just intersects with serving. So it's going to be something really fun, really amazing. Looking forward to it. Now, today is, is Father's Day. Uh, really excited about that. I, for those of you who don't know me, I'm father of, of three kids. And um, it, it feels an honor that God's chosen me to be a father. And today's message is for, is for dads, specifically for dads. I hope you guys enjoy your beanies. Did everybody get a, a, all our men get a beanie when they walked in? I just want to say that our cameraman, Solly over here, um, Solly, are you still over there? No, he may be in the back. He has a beanie on. He looks so cool in his. Like, he just looks like he's got the beanie and the headphones and he was holding the camera. And I was like, man, that guy looks so cool. I put mine on last night. It looked like an upside down turtle. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, my head is just too, too big for that. So. But anyway, I want to pray for us, uh, pray for this message, because I'm really hopeful that God speaks to all of our dads in here. Heavenly Father, prepare us, uh, prepare the words that come out of my mouth, 
that they come from a heart that is connected to yours, that's influenced um, by your heart, Father. And I pray, Lord, that every man in this room would receive the words that you would have for them today. In Jesus' name, amen. So today's message is called Hero. Now, hero is something that, that was put on, on my heart because for the, the course of Casey and I's marriage, we've been married since 2015, she has called me oftentimes, she said, you know, you're the hero of the house. And this usually happens when something breaks and, you know, I need to fix something. Yeah, she's like, I don't know what we would have done without you. And that makes me feel amazing, you know, so it may just even be something as, as screwing something in the wall and she's like, I can't believe you just know how to fix that. And it's like, I know, I'm amazing, I'm incredible, you know. I am the hero of that. No, she's spoken that over me so many times. And, and as I was praying about this message for you guys today, for our, our men, for our fathers today, I thought well, if your takeaway could be one thing, I would want your takeaway to be that you are the hero that God made you to be. I want you to feel like a hero. And in fact, I have statistics that back this up. You are heroes. Now, let me show you this. This is how significant you are as a father and why you're here. So research shows, you, there you go, one more. There we go. Research shows that when fathers are involved, their children are two times likely or less likely to experience teen pregnancy. That is a snippet of statistics. I actually have two full pages of just bullet pointed statistics on the benefit of having a father figure in a house or having a father figure uh, that's, that's over a child or over um, a, a household. And so you, you kind of can't deny that even based on statistics, you guys as fathers play an incredibly important role, not only in culture, but just in the, the family unit and in, in, in how much crime is in an area where there's more uh, present fathers. There's, there's statistically less crime in that area. The high crime areas tend to have absentee fathers. And these aren't my opinions. These are just strictly statistics. But see, even though you're heroes, even though that you were created to be a hero, even though the, the stats show and prove that, hey, you play a heroic role because where you're involved, life is better. Wherever you as a father get involved, life is better all around you. But we don't always feel that way. And I, this is me speaking from, you know, very much, this is my experience. I don't always feel like a hero. In fact, more times than not, maybe I don't feel like a hero. I should be at home more. I should be with the kids more. I should love my wife better, love my wife differently. You know, the, those thoughts that roll in your mind as a dad, as a father in a house, I should be this, I should be that. You're feeling pressure at work. You're feeling pressure at home. You're trying to manage that tension between both of those and what happens is, is you, you kind of get so far away from accepting that truth that, hey, I am a hero. And it turns into what, what really is a broken identity. See, we, it, our identity is in Christ. And that, that's something that we're going to unpack today. But the reason that it's broken is because you're not operating as if your identity is in Christ. Because if you were operating as if your identity was in Christ, then you would be operating as the hero that you are. But when you're not operating like the hero that you are, then the issue is, is that something has happened and our identity has been broken. So what I want to do today is I want to help us to fix those identities. Because I want to make sure that everybody here walks out like the hero that God says that you are. And I've got a representation of that. Lego Superman. In the eye of a child... And I watch this happen in, in my four-year-old's eyes. This is the greatest hero on earth. Lego Superman. But it's not as good as daddy. And it's amazing to hear that. And I think that every single father in here has that waiting for them. And you may already have that. Great for you. But if you don't have that, we're going to make sure that you walk out of here today believing that. So in order to do that, I want to start at the beginning. In the very, very beginning of this whole thing, and actually we're going to go all the way back to the beginning. We go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, to the point where God created man. Because in order for your identity to be reestablished as a hero, then I think it's really important to know where you came from. What was the creation story around you? And so we see that here in Genesis 1, 26 to 27. It says, then God said, let us, and so God's using 
plural because he's talking about himself, the Father, God the Father, the Son, that would be Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Let us make in our image. So we, those of us that have been around church for a long time, say, okay, we were all made in the image of God. Now, I love the Amplified Bible. If you're new here and you're wondering, what are all these extra things that are in here, all these bits and parentheses and brackets? And what the Amplified Bible is doing for us is it's expanding on the meaning of, of those words. So it takes the original language, the original text, and it gives context to what that word means. It's not an opinion. It's an actual, uh, literal, translated expansion on what that word really means. So, the word for our image, according to our likeness, what that means is not physical, but a spiritual personality and a moral likeness. I, I don't know about you, but knowing how powerful God is and how powerful Jesus was and all that they did, I'm glad that I got the spirit and the mind of Christ and of God put in me. I'll take that any day of the week over the, the physical presence of God. You know, we all know lots of people that are physically uh, perfect. You know, I go to the gym, I try and work out, and there's people in there that you look at and you're just like, why am I here, you know? I'm never going to be that guy, you know? Uh, some guy comes in, he's got perfect genetics, super white teeth, smiling the whole way through, 0% you know, body fat, you know, and I'm just like, I'm going to go home. So I'm, I'm thankful that, that the physical part doesn't matter. What mattered to God was that he gave you, when he created you, the spiritual personality and the moral likeness of him and his son and of the Holy Spirit. And then it goes on. It goes on to explain as, as God is creating them. And he says, and let them have complete authority. So man was created with complete authority over everything. So you, you were made in the image of God. You were given complete authority over the fish of the sea. And he lists it out for us. He says, I want to make sure that nothing gets left out. You've got authority over the fish. You've got authority over the birds of the air. You've got authority over the cattle. And then it sums it up over the entire earth. And then over everything that creeps and crawls on the earth. So you have authority over spiders. You know those rain spiders? You get like as big as your hand. When God made Adam, Adam would walk up to it and say, no, no, get out of my room, down or out, one or the other, be gone. And it would look at Adam and say, yes, sir. And it would bow out. And we don't have that luxury anymore. Thank you, sin. But God made it so that God, God gave us authority over everything. And so then it sums up here. It says, you know, God created man in his own image. And the verse goes on to say, in the image of God. God, he created man. He, he says it three different times, and that just proves and solidifies that we were made in the image of God. Now, here's why this is significant. So I don't want you to miss this. The significance of this truth that you were created in the image of God is this. Image means ownership. So in the New Testament, there's a story where people are trying to trick Jesus. The Pharisees are trying to mess him up. And they're talking about uh, paying taxes and giving, you know, money to Caesar. And, and, and they're asking him, you know, should we, you know, should we give to Caesar? What should we do? And, and Jesus says, hey, you know what? It's this coin here. It's got Caesar's head on it. So give Caesar what is his. And what Jesus is saying there is he's referring to this idea that image means ownership. The image of Caesar is on that coin. Therefore, it belongs to Caesar. So guess what? We were created in the image of God. And so therefore, we are gods. Now, we may not like the idea of saying, well, I'm owned by God. But you know what? I'd rather be owned by a loving creator than be owned by alcohol or owned by lust or owned by, uh, you know, depression or doubt or shame or whatever it is that you feel like owns you. If something's owning you other than God, then you have an image problem. And you just need reminded that you were made in the image of God. That God made you like him. And because you were made like him, he has ownership of you. Which means you are worth what he's put in you. Which is a whole lot. And so here, here's the hero part. God, God's a hero. God is a hero. And, and he, it, God is a hero of a father. And you were made in his image. So as a father, God is a hero. 
and you were made in that image. See, this is where I'm going here is I want to make sure that there is no doubt in your mind, whether you mess up or whether you get it right, or whether you choose to live it or you choose not to live it, you're at least going to know when you leave here today, whether you choose it or not, that you have the image of God that you were made in and that you are a hero. Now, to display this, I've got two stories that we're going to walk through quickly today. And these two stories, I think, are just are, are really significant because they show the father heart of God. And both of them are kind of hard. As a father, uh, the father heart of God has to make some really hard decisions with his children. And, and that's just kind of the purpose of of this is to show that as a dad, it is not always easy. It is really hard. But you know what? There is so much love in these two stories that even though God's making these hard decisions, it proves to us that God wants the best for us and that he is the hero of a father. The more that I can convince you that God is a hero, the, the easier it is to call out in you that image that God has put in you, that hero image that you carry. And so we're going to look at two garden experiences. I thought it was so cool that there's two moments in the Bible. One in, the, the, in Genesis in the Old Testament when creation began. And then there's another one that we're going to look at. That is the beginning of another new creation. And so let's go into this one first. This is the first garden experience we're going to look at. And this, the scriptures in Genesis uh, 2, 7 through 9. But it's where God made woman and then God made the garden for them when he made man and woman. So let's look at the text here. And so in chapter 7, this is, I want you to, to picture this in your mind. How, how cool this would be or how, how much intentionality that this was on behalf of God for us. So God says, then the Lord God, he formed. That is, he created the body of man. He created your body. He created the way it all works together. I mean, the, the intricacies of even just how the human eye works. Or just, I don't know about you, but it's, and this is nothing. It's just the fact that I can just like move my, if you really think about it, you can totally weird yourself out with, with how am I moving my finger? You know, like there's a million things that are happening in your brain that's telling your finger to do something. And that's like the most simple thing in the world, but there's so much complexity to us. So God formed all of that, and He made man from dust of the ground, and He breathed into His nostrils the breath of life. God is your source of life, and God shared His source of life in form of breath, and He brought to life man that He had crafted. And then the man became a living being. Here's what it means for man to be a living being He was an individual, complete in body and spirit. So there, God has made Adam an individual complete in body and spirit. God crafted Adam. And then we go on to the next verse here in, in verse 8. And the Lord God, he then planted a garden, which is an oasis in the east, in Eden, which means the land of delight, the land of happiness. And he put the man whom he had formed and created there. So God makes the garden and says, here you go, Adam, go at it. Now, because Adam uh, has authority over everything, there's no fear. He's not worried about bugs and snakes and mosquitoes and all of that stuff because he's got authority over all of it. So God gives him this beautiful garden here. And then in verse 9, it goes on to say, And in that garden, the Lord God caused to grow. So now God's going to talk about here's all the things that he gave Adam. Every tree that's desirable to eat, uh, that is good, suitable, and pleasant for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of this garden. So this garden had the tree of life. God also put the tree of knowledge of good and evil in here. So Adam makes, or God makes Adam in his image. God's a hero, Adam is a hero. God makes woman, puts Adam in, in authority over everything, and he's got this beautiful couple here. But something unfortunate happens. See, Adam... He's given dominion over everything first. And, and here's what God means by that. See, God says, okay, Adam, I'm going to bless you too. I'm going to grant you certain authority. And he said to them, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. That's a great command. It says, Adam and Eve, you're naked. You don't care that you're naked. 
be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. It's basically saying have sex with each other and enjoy it. And just make a bunch of babies and, and have kids and, and, and be a family. See, God is already setting up the family unit here. And then he says, and subjugate it. Put it underneath your power and rule over, dominate the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and every single living thing that moves on earth. I mean, that, that's a pretty cool thing for God to do. Sounds like God is a pretty great father that he's setting up these people. Adam and Eve was such a great setup. And so then God says in, in the next verse, God says, Behold, I've given you every plant which is yielding seed that is on the surface of the entire earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed and it shall be good for you. And then in verse 30, God finishes it off here by saying, To all the animals on earth, every bird of the air, and to everything that moves on the ground, all the spiders, all the snakes, all the centipedes, to everything in which there is breath of life, all of those things, I have given every green plant for food. I've given it all to you. And it was so because he commanded it. So Adam and Eve are perfectly set up. But it doesn't stay that way. See, Adam and Eve would end up falling. They would end up losing everything that they had. They lose it all. And in Genesis chapter 3 and, and verse 22, here's where we're going to start to see the father heart of God. See, you thought that the father heart of God was in the creation of Adam and Eve and in the creation of the garden. I mean, that's cool. That's really, really cool. God really loved them. He really set them up well for success. But here, it's in the downfall of man that we really see the hero that God is. So let's look. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. This is the moment where Adam and Eve have eaten fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And God has walked through the garden and he's found them and, and the Holy Spirit and the Son and the Father, they get together and they say, Behold, the man has become like one of us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because now he knows how to distinguish between good and evil. And now he might stretch out his hand and take from the tree of life as well and eat its fruit and live in this fallen sinful condition forever. So where is the father heart of God in this verse? See, this is something that, that we read over and we miss. I've never caught this before. And when I caught this, I thought, oh my goodness, this is so good. This is so wonderful. Because see, when Adam and Eve eat from the fruit... Well, what we're going to see in the next verse, and, and don't go there quite yet, Karina, is, is we're going to see that God's eventually going to kick them out. It's like, you're in trouble. You did a bad thing. Go on and get out of here. But that's not actually what he's doing. See, if we go down here and we look at this verse and it says, And now he might stretch out his hand, take from the tree of life as well. So now he's eaten from the knowledge, from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He's entered a sinful state. And then if he eats from the tree of life, then he will forever live in a sinful state. And so what God has done is he said, I do not want you to live in this fallen, sinful condition forever. See, I, 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 my heart breaks that you made this decision, Adam and Eve. And my heart breaks that now you're like one of us. Like you know the difference between good and evil. But I don't want you to get stuck that way. See, from this moment, God begins to make decisions as a loving father with the father heart of love to restore us. Because God did not want, it was never his will, that we spend eternity living in a sinful nature. And when we don't choose God, that's what happens. But God, right here, in this moment, when Adam and Eve broke the, the rule, and as, as we would tell Benjamin, our four-year-old, Adam and Eve chose the hard way. There's an easy way, there's a hard way. And they chose the hard way here. So look at what God does to that. In verse 23, Therefore, the Lord God sent Adam away from the Garden of Eden to till and cultivate the ground from which he was taken. See, we think this is the punishment here. This is what we think is the punishment. But actually, this is the loving heart of God. God rescued us from living in eternal sin, starting with Adam and Eve. He noticed it right away that, oh my goodness, look at what they've done. They've eaten from, from one 
tree. And if they eat from the other, they're going to spend all of eternity living in this state of sin. We have to not let that happen. So God banished them from the Garden of Eden so that they could not eat from the tree of life. So where do we see the loving heart, the perfect picture of fatherly love? In this story, where is God's perfect fatherly love? See, I would say that, that for, for me, where I see this is around our house with our, our son, Benjamin. Uh, we have Leith, who's a 15-year-old. We have Benjamin, who's a four-year-old. And then Wyatt is uh, a little bit over one years old. And with Benjamin, we oftentimes tell him, hey, we, we make decisions for you. And we ask you to do things because we want you to be safe. And so every decision that we make for Benjamin, and we've explained to him, this is for your safety. So you have to obey us for your safety. You can't run out into the middle of the road. That would be dangerous for you. You can't do rough play uh, right next to the, uh, the wood-burning stove because that would be very dangerous. So we constantly explain to him, hey, there are consequences when you do something wrong, but that's because safety is our value for you. We are committed to keeping you safe. And it's crazy that any kid stays alive, myself included, because just keeping them safe in the house is a, is a big enough challenge. We're selling half of our furniture because of Wyatt. We just need more space for that dude to run around and less things for him to hit with his head. <laughs> and so we, we wanted to be safe. Karina, put the next slide up, please. Where, where's, so where is God's perfect fatherly love? See, safety. God did what he had to do to keep Adam and Eve safe from living an eternal life stuck in sin. See, it's safety. God wanted to keep them and their eternity safe. Same with, with when I punish Benjamin or I take him away from something that's really dangerous. When I pull him away from a hot stove or something that he's playing next to. It's not because he disobeyed. It's not because he's, a, he's bad and I'm going to punish him. It's for his safety. And see, here we have the, the heavenly father, the, God, the, the father heart of God here. He's done something that we've all probably read as he's been mad and he's punished Adam and Eve. But actually, God kept Adam and Eve safe from living an eternity doomed to sin. So that, that's one picture of the Father heart of God. And remember, everything that we learn about God, we're also learning about you. So let's go to the next garden. This garden, we fast forward from Genesis, and now we're in Luke, and in, in chapter Luke 20, 22. And, and this, where, where we are is that Jesus, he's had the Last Supper, he's done all of the, kind of the Passover, he's done all of that. And Jesus is coming up on that moment where he's going to be arrested and Judas is going to betray him and he's going to be put on the cross. He's going to hang there on the cross. And so Jesus has gone to a place that he always goes to. It's, it's called the Mount of Olives, the Garden of Gethsemane. And he goes there often to pray. It's a habit of his. It's something that he does often. And the disciples go there with him and looming over him, he knows what's about to come. He knows he's about to give his life for all of humanity. He knows that it's coming. The disciples don't. And so Jesus sets up this moment. And it's, it says this in verse 39. And he came out and he went. So this is him leaving one place, going to the Mount of Olives. And so as was his habit, because prayer was a habit to him, to the Mount of Olives and the disciples, they followed him. So they're in tow. And when he arrived at the place called Gethsemane, he said to them, Listen, guys, I want you to pray continually that you may not fall into temptation. That, that, that's, that's what he tells them. Here's your assignment. Matthew, uh, Peter, all you guys, uh, this is what you're going to do. Okay? We're going to get there. You're going to sit down. And you're going to continually pray that you do not fall into temptation. And, and here's the word that's used in the original language here. The, the words enter into temptation. It actually means succumb to evil power. Because Jesus knew, God knew that Satan was on the move. God knew that, that something very um, just dark was about to happen. So Jesus knew he was about to be arrested. He knew his disciples would need uh, to be safe. He knew his disciples would need, need to be firm in their faith and firm in the foundation of everything that he's taught them. So he's saying, 
guys, I want you to pray because I don't want you to be, I don't want you to give in to, to this evil power. Don't let the devil put negative thoughts in your mind like, oh no, you know, Jesus has been arrested. We can no longer believe in him. Why didn't he stop this? Uh, we, what is it that we're doing? Midlife crisis. We've spent the last three years following uh, just a really good like Amway salesman. And so now here we are and he's been arrested. And so God's saying, Jesus is saying, hey, hey, just pray. Because I don't want you to succumb to the evil. And so then it goes on in the next verse. He's given them instructions. So Jesus, he withdraws from about a stone's throw away, which means that he could be heard. The disciples could hear him. He could hear them and he could see them. They could see him. And he knelt down. What's significant about Jesus kneeling down is, is at the time people stood up to pray. And Jesus doesn't stand to pray in this moment. He kneels down. He gets down on the ground because he, he's feeling the weight of what's about to happen to him. And he prays saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup of divine wrath from me. Yet not my will, but always yours be done. You know, I don't know if you guys have, if the father's in the room, I'm sure, you, I'm sure we've all dealt with this, but there's a moment when your kids are little and they get hurt. And they look at you and they say, make it go away. Make the pain stop. And it just aches you on the inside. You know, whether it's, a, it's one thing for a scraped knee, you know, for, for Jam to come in and say, you know, my knee hurts. Make it go away. Help me, Daddy. And your heart pours out to that. But some of us have had, you know, the incredible misfortune of having kids that are really, really, really sick. When, when we had Wyatt, Wyatt was born and... He, he was circumcised, but they, something happened and a stitch popped out. And, and that night, Casey, you know, woke me up or it was actually right before we went to bed. And, and she went to change Wyatt's diaper. And when she kind of opened his diaper up, he was sitting in quite literally a, a pool of his own blood. And in that moment, I just shoved a nappy on top of it, a clean one. And I pulled his bloody nappy and tied it in a knot and just cinched him down. And we ran off to Vincent Pilati. And rushed him into the emergency room there, and they got to work on him. He lost so much blood. And while I was sitting there, the thought of my son hurting like that. And you could, we weren't in the room, but I could hear him crying and hear him screaming. And then I, I, we're in the, the children's unit there at Vincent, and I'm just thinking every doorway has a child in here. Ha, oh, man. And I'm watching fathers and mothers come and go. And I know that my kid just needs some stitches and he'll be okay. But their kids are really, really sick. That pain, that heartache, that's just a hard thing as a dad. Because you want to fix it, but you can't fix it. You want to make it go away, but you can't make it go away. Instead, you've got to be strong. God made you to be a hero in how you lead that situation. And so God, he hears his son, Jesus. Say, if we're willing, remove this cup. Now I want to talk to you about the significance of this cup, this cup of, of wrath here. It says of divine wrath. In the Old Testament, Jesus often quotes the Old Testament as, as, as the, this cup representing the wrath of God. So Jesus is saying, remove the cup from me. And that cup represents the wrath of God. Now I've got about probably 10 Bible verses on this. And if you just, even if you go on, on Google and you just type in Bible, cup, wrath, it'll pull all these verses up from Jeremiah, from Isaiah, from all different spots in the, in the Old Testament where God talks about drinking from the cup of the wrath of God. It basically means I'm about to destroy this nation. You drink from this cup and you are going to get destroyed. And he tells, tells David at times, hey, take the cup and give it to them to drink and all who drink from the cup will receive my wrath. He's saying they will be destroyed. So when Jesus says, take the cup, can you take this cup from me, this cup of your wrath? He knows that that cup means he's going to be destroyed. It's not just a, a it, it, we, we, we overlook that. This cup thing that Jesus is referencing is the real deal. In fact, the cup, it doesn't actually represent death, but it represents judgment. See, Jesus wasn't afraid of dying. Because he knew his identity in his father, but he knew his purpose. 
And so Jesus has no problem with death. In fact, after he fulfills his purpose on the cross, he just, he just lets all the air out and dies. He just lets it go. There's no problem with dying. He was the only one of the three on the crosses that didn't need his legs broken because he'd already just gone on. Next, done, box ticked, head to heaven, done. But what Jesus knew that he was going to receive that was so uh, hard was the judgment that was going to come. Now, I've got a couple lines and a couple quotes here so that this really sinks in. This is Jesus in his worst, in his lowest moment. When he asked God if there's any other way, here's kind of what it's saying. Jesus, in this moment, he became an enemy of God, an enemy of God, who was judged and forced to drink the cup of the Father's fury so that we don't even have to take a sip of that. And then Charles Spurgeon, he, he writes this amazing quote and he says, I'm never afraid of exaggeration when I speak of what my Lord Jesus endured. All hell was distilled into that cup. All the judgment that would ever be passed, that ever has been passed, that is being passed or will be passed is distilled down into a liquid, put in that cup. And Jesus, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, he was made to drink it. And so Jesus is saying, God, is there any way for me to let go, for, for there to be something other than the judgment and the wrath that is coming? Because I'm about to consume every single sin that's ever been, is, and will be committed. I'm about to drink all of your wrath, God, that wrath that separates the people from you and calls out. Now, Jesus' father, he doesn't, he doesn't take the cup from him. In fact, Jesus' father, he lets the cup remain. And then now what happens is an angel appears. And in verse 43, this angel comes down. And the, the angel, God sends an angel. He doesn't take the cup away. But God says, now an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. You know what? There's two times when an angel appears to strengthen Jesus. And they're both at his lowest. Once is when he fasted for 40 days and, and nights. And then he was tempted by the devil. After that was done, the angels came and mended him. And this is the second time Jesus is asked, God, take this cup. And God instead sends an angel to him. But he was being strengthened. And in that moment of strengthening, because he needed it, Jesus was in incredible agony, deeply distressed and anguished, almost to the point of death. He prayed more intently and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down on the ground. See, Jesus asked God, is there another way? And the loving heart of God said, there's not another way. But when he sent the angel, what it did is, is Jesus' situation did not change, but his spirit does change. And what we see happen in the next verse, and this reminds me of like a Rocky movie where Jesus is down, or if you guys have seen the movie Creed where they're down and the ref is counting, you know, 10, 9, 8, and counting down and at the last minute, they get up and they charge forward at their purpose. And that is what happens here is that Jesus is down. He's, he's so worried that blood is coming from his pores. That's a real thing where you can be so consumed with worry and anxiety that your pores open up and dilate. And, and blood can actually come from those. And it drips off his face. And, but Jesus doesn't stay down. See, it says, when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping they were sleeping from sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not fall into temptation. See, Jesus, he got up off the ground. He got up off the ground because God changed his spirit. That's something only a father can do. When my kids, I'll never forget, Letha had a bike wreck. He was seven years old and he had this huge bike wreck. He was riding with no hands on the handlebars. And he's going down the road. We were living in White River, you know, up in Pumalunga. And he gets the wheel wobble and he falls over the bike. It's a bad one. Casey just immediately wants to run. I said, no, 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 hang on. And I, we calmly walked to him. And I said, come on, Leafa, you know, only losers cry. No, I didn't say that to him. <laughs> just making sure you guys were still with me. But I said, hey, in this moment of your spirit, Benet, come on, let's get back on the bike here. You're not done. You're not out. You're going to learn to ride this bike. Let's go. Didn't even give him a chance. And he responded. So where do we see the heart of God? Where do we see, where is God's perfect fatherly love? 
in this situation here. See, when God said no to Jesus, he said yes to all of humanity. And that's the image that you were made in. You were made with that image. Now, between those two gardens, there's two different things that happen. See, in, in the garden of, of Adam and Eve, what happened is, is that they weren't supposed to eat from, from the fruit of the tree. But Adam said, this line, he said, my will, not yours be done. And he ate from the, the tree. The difference here is Jesus, when he prays his prayer, when he said, God, can you take the cup from me? Jesus says, your will, not mine be done. So whether or not you say, God, it's your will, or you say, no, it's my will, guess what didn't change? The Father's heart of love for you. And that's who you were made in the image of. Now, uh, one more thing that I just want to talk about, and this is something I added in this morning. It was really on my heart. It's sonship. See, when you talk about being a father, it's hard to, to not talk about uh, sonship. So this would be uh, whether it's your son or whether it's a daughter or, or it could be anything. But sonship, let me define this for you. See, in the Old Testament, sonship, it's actually bound with family and identity and vocation. So basically what that means is you did what your dad did. So if you grew up in a farmer's house, you are not going to come of age and go away and learn how to be a blacksmith. That just did not happen. You grew up in a farmer's household, you became a farmer. Jesus grew up in a carpenter's household, and he even became a carpenter. He even took over the carpentry business for a while before he went out into his ministry. And so this idea of sonship is you do what your dad did. So we are sons of God in that we are supposed to be God's image bearers. He is our father to imitate. So we want to imitate him. If you're living a godly life, then you're in God's sonship. You're acting in it. So here's the thing. God, the perfect heavenly father, everything that was in him is in you. And all that that's in you is in him. All that potential is there. And God has modeled what a father is. And he has called us into sonship with him. And he says that as we accept Jesus in our hearts, as we turn our life over in faith to him, that when you accept Jesus, when you know Jesus, you will also know the Father. And by knowing, that means you will know the Father and he will know you. That's that transition of love. Now, you and God are becoming more and more like one. He, you've accepted that love and he's then able to pour his love out on you. That's who you inherited. That's the hero that was put in you. And so as you think about being a hero, as you think about being a hero in your sphere of influence and to your kids, let me ask you this. What kind of father are you being? And is it the kind of father that you want your children to imitate? Because everything that God is has been put in you as far as your identity, as far as the fact that you are a hero. So what I would ask you this today is we're going to uh, sing a song here, and this is just going to be a moment of reflection for, for you guys. And this is a question that I would ask, or this is a statement that I want you to accept. Be the hero that you were made to be today. And what that means is that, is that when, the, when Naomi's going to come out and sing a song called Hero, and, and when she does, I want us all to, to stand, and we're going to put the lyrics on the screen. But, but you are a hero. Be the hero that you were made to be. You know what that means? That means you're going to have to accept the reality that God made you to be a hero. And in order to accept that reality, you're going to have to deny a bunch of false lies. And I know firsthand that that is, it feels like it's nearly impossible. So all I'm asking is for the next three minutes, three or four minutes, that while Naomi sings and we stand and our prayer team is going to come down in the wings and they're here for you today to pray with you if you have any struggle with accepting that you were made to be a hero you can come down front I would invite you to come down front and all you have to do is walk up to one of them and they already know what to pray pray over you and what they they already know how to pray for you you don't have to share your whole life story they'll pray with you so what I hope is that in the next four minutes you have the courage and the boldness 
to ask the question, if I'm going to be the hero that I was made to be, God, what's the next step that I take? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you.